uh, in my case, uh, of molecular astrophysics uh, and astrochemistry. Uh, so uh, his, uh, his influence, uh, while most people maybe in this room know about his influence in astronomy, he also had a very lasting impact on, on molecular physics. Uh, so given uh, his large impact and the, the large presence he had here with us, uh, uh, we endowed uh, the Delgarno Memorial Lecture, which is what we will, we're here for uh, today. Uh, this is the first time that we have it in three years, so we are really excited uh, to be back here in person and really celebrating both the, uh, the life and the, the work of Alex Delgarno, but then also, of course, of uh, this year's uh, Delgarno Lecture. And uh, the speaker of today, David Neufeld, is uh, no stranger to this place. He, he did his PhD here at Harvard, and very appropriately for this lecture, he did it under the uh, supervision or advisement uh, of Alex Delgarno. So it's, of course, a great pleasure to uh, invite, you, uh, invite you back. Uh, after receiving his uh, PhD uh, here, uh, David uh, did uh, spend some time at Berkeley before joining the faculty at uh, John Hopkins, where he has been ever since. But he has also uh, been back here, I realized, for the Bach lecture uh, in the 1990s. So one of our, uh, one of our, other, uh, one of our other prize uh, lectures that we have uh, for, uh, for junior uh, scientists. So David Neufeld, uh, like his uh, mentor, uh, Alex Delgarno, uh, is uh, an expert in molecular <coughs> astrophysics. And uh, within this sort of big topic, I would say his interests are, are broad. Uh, anything that has to do with interstellar or circumstellar media, media I think you can, he's either already done work in or you can get him interested uh, to think about it. Uh, so today we will be hearing about uh, a particular um, sort of topic within this, this broader uh, work, which is on, um, uh, which, which um, is on this discovery of this very cool uh, molecular ion, which has implications not just for today's circumstellar media, but also when we think back in time, how the chemistry of our universe uh, has evolved as the universe uh, evolved with it. But with that, I don't want to delay the lecture any further. Instead, I would like to invite uh, this year's Delgarno lecturer, David Neufeld, to the, to the floor. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks very much for that very gracious uh, introduction. And um, it's an incredible pleasure for me to be uh, with you here in person um, and a great honor to uh, be giving the Dalgano Memorial Lectures uh, this year. And it means a lot to me personally because of the great uh, respect and affection I had for Alex Dalgano. What I wanted to do today um, is talk about uh, a particular molecule that I think was of great interest to Alex uh, and which has been discovered uh, in the last few years in the interstellar medium uh, and tell you why uh, it's interesting and the long story uh, leading to its eventual discovery. So in the other two lectures uh, that I've given this week, the emphasis has been slightly different. It's been on uh, the way studies of molecules, carefully interpreted, can give us unique information uh, of general astrophysical interest. So that might interest somebody who knows little about molecules but might be interested in cosmic rays, for example. Um, this is a little bit different. This is the case, actually, of an astrophysical environment that we really understand quite well. And so we're not really going to learn anything uh, that we didn't already know about this planetary nebula in which the uh, HEH plus, the helium hydride ion, was discovered. Um, so this is a case where Astrophysics, if you like, sets up a laboratory for us to understand and demonstrate various molecular processes that would be hard to study elsewhere. So what I'd like to do today then is give uh, an introduction to 
uh, this particular ion. Um, I'll then describe how it was first detected using uh, the SOFIA Airborne Observatory that is operated jointly by NASA and DLR, its uh, German counterpart. I'll then discuss how we were able to follow this up with some uh, mid-infrared observations from the ground. And those observations led to a serendipitous discovery of another molecular ion in this um, source. Uh, and the details pose a very curious puzzle that was explained actually with help from a paper uh, and then a scientist uh, at CFA. So uh, I'd, I'd like to tell you about that. So this is all rather specific, and I think it's good to not speak in too much generalities and have specific examples. But the generalities that I hope to convince you of are twofold. Firstly, that nature has a remarkable tendency to make molecules. And the first course I took on this with Alex, he noted that um, you would find mold growing in nuclear reactors. Um, and this actually turns out to be true. In fact, there are certain types of molds uh, that love uh, high radiation environments uh, and were found in uh, Chernobyl. Um, so, you know, rather than uh, destroying molecules, molecules are very hardy and can survive in very extreme environments. And then the other is sort of a, a, a great theme underlying Alex Dalgano's debt legacy is that there can be a very close interplay between very fundamental studies of molecular physics and astrophysics. And I'll basically discuss with these two molecules uh, two examples of how that happens. Okay, so let me start with the uh, introduction. Um, and Helium hydride cations were actually first discovered almost 100 years ago by Hognes and Lunn uh, in a laboratory measurement where they uh, had a discharge, an electric discharge, in a mixture of uh, molecular hydrogen and helium, and then examined the products with mass spectrometry. So, you know, you basically have these ions uh, moving in a magnetic field and you see how much they're deflected and so you can measure the charge to mass ratio. And they observe one big peak at a charge to mass ratio of one, so that would be uh, obviously protons. And then there was another peak with a charge to mass ratio of a half and that's the H2 plus molecular ion. And then one with uh, a charge to mass ratio of a third, that's H3 plus that had been discovered um, a few years earlier, actually, by J.J. Thompson, the discoverer of the electron, um, and which actually plays a very important role in uh, interstellar medium chemistry as well. Uh, and then, if and only if you have helium along with hydrogen, you see a peak at one quarter, that's helium plus, and then a peak at one fifth. What could that be? Well, really, the only possibility is this molecular ion, HEH plus. And this sounds a very exotic thing, and in some ways it is, but in some ways it's very familiar uh, because it's isoelectronic with molecular hydrogen. So in molecular hydrogen, of course, we have two protons and then two electrons, mainly in between the protons, sticking things together. Um, and uh, there's uh, transitions that we can uh, detect in the infrared uh, these are only quadrupole transitions where the rotational quantum number J changes by 2 because of certain symmetry rules and also because H2 doesn't have a dipole moment. Uh, so there's this transition at 28 microns. But if you imagine now that we simply added uh, a proton and two neutrons to one of the uh, nuclei, well, then you would have... HEH plus, again two electrons, um, and they'd be in the same spinless, orbital angular, momentumless ground state, a singlet sigma state, um, and now there would be a dipole moment. Uh, the rotational constant is less because it's heavier, so the transitions move to shorter, I'm sorry, to longer wavelengths, and you would have transitions with 
uh, j just changing by one, and one of them would be at 149 microns that I get, uh, will get to later. Um, just as an aside, there's sort of an interesting other way that uh, HEH plus or something very similar can be produced, and this was recognized in the 70s. If you have triti tritium, molecular tritium, um, uh, well, you have two radioactive uh, nuclei. Tritium, of course, is the uh, 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 mass number three uh, hydrogen nucleus, which is unstable to beta decay. It decays to helium three. Uh, so when this happens, one of your what is chemically hydrogen nuclei sort of magically transforms into helium, and you basically get HEH+. And the amazing thing is that uh, despite the fact that, of course, radioactive decay is pretty energetic, uh, the molecule survives at least 90% of the time. And then you have uh, uh, helium tritium plus, it's helium 3 tritium plus, um, and there's a recoil which actually excites vibrational lines, which for this uh, isotopologue are uh, at about four and a half microns and were detected in this experiment. Um, we'll see uh, also that we can detect a vibrational uh, emissions from space from uh, HEH+. Although it's a stable closed shell molecule, uh, it's only very weakly bound. And one way of characterizing that binding uh, is by the proton affinity of the atom or molecule to which the proton has been attached, in this case helium. And there's a table here. And you can see that uh, helium binds more weakly to protons than any other neutral species in this list, and in fact, any other neutral molecule there is. So he helium hydride cations will react with anything that's neutral. Doesn't matter what it is. It's always going to be energetically favorable. So, I mean, depending on the various definitions of an acid, but in some sense, this is the strongest acid uh, you can have. Okay, so that's the, the physics of the molecule. The connection to astrophysics, uh, or the possible connection to astrophysics, was recognized in the late 1970s uh, with actually what turned out to be an incorrect suggestion by Dabrowski, uh, Dr Dabrowski and Hertzberg that uh, vibrational emissions from helium hydride cations might be responsible for mid-infrared features that had been observed from uh, a planetary nebula at uh, around 3.3 and 3.4 microns. Uh, any infrared astronomer in this room will know what those actually were. They were uh, transitions of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that we now know are very uh, abundant in space. But even a wrong suggestion can be uh, very stimulating, and this led to many theoretical studies uh, that were carried out to figure out whether you might hope to see the helium hydride ion in a planetary nebula. And the first of these studies was from uh, John Black, who was a recent graduate uh, of Alex's. Um, and uh, he uh, did a calculation suggesting that uh, you might get helium hydride cations in the transition region of planetary nebulae such as NGC 7027. So I'm talking about the, the region that separates the ionized uh, part of the nebula from the neutral part of the nebula. Um, this was actually a rather pessimistic uh, prediction, and there was really the key paper on this subject was by uh, Alex and his student Wayne Roberge, who pointed out um, a reaction that not considered previously uh, that would be quite effective in forming this ion. And this is a so-called radiative association reaction, which are always slow, but involve uh, basically a collision, in this case, between helium plus and hydrogen uh, to form uh, this molecule. Of course, they can't just stick together. They, the, something has to take away the excess energy, and that thing would be a photon, and that's why this is a, a slow radiative process. 
but uh, they estimated the rate was something like 300 times larger than what J uh, John, uh, sorry, they estimated that you would get an abundance roughly 300 times larger than what John Black had predicted. So that got it into the realm where you might actually hope to uh, detect it, and they mentioned this 149 micron transition uh, that I had had on the previous slide, and also transitions in the mid-infrared between three and four microns as possible ways of detecting this. And then uh, this is all based, of course, very heavily on the reaction rates that you expect for these processes. And uh, subsequently, uh, with Bernie Ziegelman, who uh, was a postdoc here, um, Alex did a, a much more detailed calculation that implied that this radiative association reaction I mentioned uh, was even faster uh, than they had calculated previously, making it an even more uh, likely thing that uh, this molecule might be detected. So people started looking for this, um, and the first way they tried to do this was from the ground looking for those vibrational transitions uh, in uh, the so-called L-band. Um, and there were two unsuccessful, or at least two unsuccessful searches for this with uh, uh, mid-infrared spectrometers uh, on ground-based telescopes. If you want to look at that rotational transition at much longer wavelength, 149 micron, then you need to go uh, at least to airborne altitude and preferably to space. Uh, and there was a search for this with the Infrared Space Observatory, ISO. And Alex was uh, one of the uh, co-authors on uh, this search. And it did show up a feature at the expected frequency. But unfortunately, there's another line of a known molecule in this nebula. It's the CH molecule. Uh, that is very close in frequency. And at the resolution that could be obtained with this spectrometer, they're completely indistinguishable. Uh, so one couldn't really say whether this was CH or HEH plus or what fraction of which. You could look at other lines of CH and ask how, much, how strong would you expect this CH line to be? And the answer was sort of, well, between 50 and 100% of this feature came from CH. And so the amount that came from HEH plus was between 0 and 50%. The other interest in this ion uh, emerged actually from studies of the early universe, entirely theoretical, where you could think about the question, what molecules could you form before there are any stars? Um, and you could also ask, uh, what was the very first molecule to form in the history of the universe? So, you know, we start out uh, and the universe starts in a hot big bang, it cools. Uh, we start first to get baryons, um, protons and neutrons, uh, and then we start to have recombination between uh, protons and electrons. Um, I should say even before that, we start uh, forming nuclei, uh, composite structures composed of nucleons, then we form atoms. But what was the very first molecular bond to form? And the answer, according to the latest theoretical models, which are based very heavily on uh, studies that Alex did of the fundamental physical processes, the answer is it is this molecular ion, HEH+. And it starts to form... Uh, at a redshift of about 7,000, when the universe uh, obviously would have had a temperature of about 20,000 Kelvin. There'd be nothing cooler in the universe than 20,000 Kelvin. Um, and so the answer to this question, which I had never occurred to me to ask, what was the very first molecular bond to form? The answer is uh, helium hydride. And it could be of interest uh, because it can then be a pathway to the formation of molecular hydrogen, which I've uh, shown here. And at early times, uh, it is the, uh, an important pathway. Although later on uh, in the epoch of galaxy formation, there are other uh, epochs, uh, uh, sorry, there are other production mechanisms. 
Um, and the way it forms is that helium recombines first, uh, and then helium is coexisting with hydrogen that is still ionized. And it's another one of these radiative, associate, uh, radiative association reactions that, according to these models, forms HEH+. Okay, so that's where things stood until about three years ago when uh, a team led by uh, Ralph Guston uh, obtained the first detection of uh, this ion uh, in the astrophysical universe uh, using NASA's SOFIA Airborne Observatory, which gets above 99% of the water vapor in Earth's atmosphere and so has a relatively unobstructed view of uh, the far infrared spectral region, which is where, as I mentioned, the fundamental rotational transition of HEH plus uh, lies at 149 microns. Um, the frequency of this line uh, la lay or d lies above the range that was covered in the earlier Herschel uh, space mission. So Sophia at this point was the only game uh, in town. And uh, the team led by Rolf Guston and uh, people at uh, Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy and University of Cologne uh, have been really uh, fine-tuning the instrument GREAT, which stands for German Receiver uh, uh, for Terahertz Astronomy, um, over many years. And uh, they were able to detect uh, this transition from the exact young planetary nebula that John Black and Dalgan and collaborators had suggested was the best target. Uh, so this is a, a planetary nebula around a very hot white dwarf star with a temperature of about 190,000 Kelvin. And uh, this shows uh, in the histogram, or the, the sort of black and gray histogram, the detection of uh, HEH+, which is, uh, as you can see, a very secure detection, and this instrument has very high spectral resolution. So in fact, one can rather easily separate out this CH line, which I said uh, was uh, completely uh, unresolved with uh, the previous ISO mission, could separate that out from uh, HEH+. And so this is the uh, final spectrum uh, of HEH plus that was uh, obtained. Um, one question arises here is, uh, you know, so you've detected a single line, is that sufficient? Does that prove that you've detected this molecule? And certainly at millimeter wavelengths, people are rightfully skeptical when uh, molecules are identified on the basis of a single line. Uh, because at millimeter wavelengths is just a very high density of spectral lines of many, many different molecules. Uh, and so just finding one line at the right frequency isn't really proof enough. On the other hand, of course, nobody really doubts the identity of the H121 centimeter line. Um, and it's basically a quantitative argument. So you could ask, given the density of lines of comparable strength in this region, what's the chance that some unidentified line would lie at the exact wavelength where HEH plus was detected? And the answer is less than one in a thousand. So to analyze this, uh, we use one of the classic tools in astrophysics, the cloudy photoionization model, to predict how the density of atoms and uh, ions, H plus, uh, and He plus, and electrons uh, varies as you go further and further away from the central star, which you can see uh, there. And um, we then uh, considered the various chemical processes, which were not included in Cloudy, uh, to figure out how much HEH plus we would expect and whether it could account for the uh, line, the uh, strength that we obs had observed. Um, and 
We agree with uh, Robert and Dalgano that it's the first radiative association uh, process that is how this molecule is formed. Um, we used a slightly more modern calculation, uh, which gives a rather similar answer, slightly less, for the rate at which the molecule would be formed. Uh, and then we uh, had uh, a couple of destruction mechanisms that obviously balance the formation of HEH plus to give you a certain equilibrium abundance. And those were uh, reaction with electrons, so-called dissociative recombination, and also the fact, as I mentioned, that HEH plus will transfer its proton to anything neutral, and there's hydrogen around, uh, and so that's another destruction uh, mechanism. And then you have to figure out uh, okay, so you have a certain amount of HEH plus, but uh, how much uh, excitation will you have uh, that will give you radiation that you can see? And so you need to know the rate coefficients or the cross sections for electrons exciting this molecule into the upper state or higher states that could decay to the upper state. And uh, the bottom line was a result rather similar to what had been obtained by uh, Dalgano and their, uh, his collaborators, that there would be a peak in the abundance of HEH+. Plus. That's this green curve here, where you had the maximum overlap between helium plus and neutral hydrogen. So you want to go right to the edge of the ionized region, uh, and there would be a thin shell where HEH+. Plus is present. This is just an expanded shell showing you the density of these various molecules uh, that are labeled here uh, as a function of distance from the star. Um, it's actually an interesting thing about planetary nebulae that the region of ionized helium, or nebulae in general, is slightly larger than the region of ionized hydrogen. And that's because the uh, cross-sections are falling rather rapidly uh, in the ultraviolet beyond the ionization threshold, so that um, photons capable of ionizing helium uh, get uh, a little further than photons that, are, uh, that uh, are the ones mainly ionizing hydrogen. So it's sort of an interesting test, actually, of this uh, uh, cloudy model for uh, planetary nebulae, the fact that you have an overlap between the two species that are reacting to make this ion, namely helium plus and neutral hydrogen. So then we followed this up by trying what had failed in the 1980s and looking from ground-based telescopes for vibrational lines. And this we did with the infrared telescope facility that NASA operates on Mauna Kea. And it has this beautiful uh, spectrometer called iShell, uh, which has very, very good uh, spectral resolution, 80,000. So lambda over delta lambda of 80,000. Um, and we placed uh, a slit uh, along uh, the minor axis of this slightly elongated nebula. This image actually is what the uh, star tracker uh, showed us during the uh, flight, uh, not flight, <laughs> during the observations. And uh, we detected, in fact, many, many different lines. This spectrometer has a very nice, wide, simultaneous wavelength coverage. So there's many, many recombination lines of hydrogen and helium that are shown uh, in the top three lines on this plot. Um, and then uh, this is the uh, helium hydride vibrational line that we were looking for. So this is a pretty solid detection. Um, this is multiplied by 10 to sort of put them on a readable scale. But uh, this is a secure detection. There was another line uh, that we also sort of detected. Maybe you'll be less convinced by that because it's right in the wing of one of these strong hydrogen recombination lines. So the blue histogram here is the hydrogen recombination line where uh, there's a blend with the helium hydride. 
And the black template is another hydrogen recombination line, which might be assumed to have an identical line profile, more or less. And if you take the difference and sort of shift it to the HEH plus frequency, you get this, which maybe is a little less convincing. But uh, anyway, uh, we feel that these were secure uh, detections. And so then we can ask, how well does our model do in explaining all these emissions uh, that we detected from the ground and from uh, SOFIA? And it's basically all within a factor three, although typically the line is, with one exception, the, the lines that we did detect are um, stronger than uh, the predictions. And this may just reflect some shortcoming in uh, the rate coefficients or the various molecular data that go into this. So there are all the different formation and destruction processes. I mean, we've modeled them as carefully as we can. And then you also need to know how effectively the helium hydride that you have is excited to give a mission that we detect. And so that's sort of another uncertainty. But in any case, there's no doubt now that this molecule that people have been looking for, for four decades, and which um, is believed to have been the first molecule ever to form in the history of the universe, uh, has finally been uh, detected. Uh, and there's just a few minor inconsistencies. I mean, a factor three in this business of astrochemistry is not such a bad uh, discrepancy. Um, so uh, that was uh, uh, the situation there. So I now wanted to just turn to a second example of the interplay between molecular physics and uh, astrophysical observations of molecules uh, that emerged quite serendipitously from the infrared, the mid-infrared observations uh, that I had mentioned uh, that were targeting HEH+. But it turns out we detected a whole series of unidentified lines in the pretty broad uh, spectral region covered by the instrument. And they were evenly spaced in wave number or frequency, which is basically the signature of a vibrational band coming from a molecule that has a very simple rotational structure. Uh, and the reason it, it has or must have such a simple structure is that it must be um, a molecule with no uh, electronic orbital angular momentum or uh, electronic spin. And uh, one of the few things it could have been was this molecular ion CH+. Um, and fortunately, there had been some laboratory uh, measurements uh, that uh, gave us very good rest frequencies. So uh, we were able to demonstrate then that vibrational emissions from CH plus had been uh, detected. Um, and these were within the fundamental vibrational band. So from V equals one to zero. Uh, and of course these bands are separated uh, or the vibrational structure has superimposed upon it a rotational structure. And so instead of just getting a, a single transition from one vibrational state to another, you get many different transitions uh, that are uh, slightly different frequencies because of the different rotation. So to start with, uh, we actually observed nine of these transitions. Um, again, with this beautiful eye shell spectrograph on the IRTF. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, these could be identified thanks to lab spectroscopy, which is always a critical ingredient in astrophysics. And then we got some more time uh, to look at uh, even more lines of um, CH+. Now, this is a molecule that had been uh, detected previously in this nebula by uh, Chernicharo and collaborators using the Infrared Space Observatory to look at pure rotational lines, a much longer wavelength. But this was the first detection of vibrational lines. And the results actually were quite puzzling for a reason that I will explain. Um, but first, let me just show on this slide again, it shows you how we placed a slit 
uh, across the nebula. And then, uh, well, one could look at the spectrum summed over all the elements of the slit, and that's, this is one of the lines that we detected from CH+. You also see there's a nearby line of molecular hydrogen. Or you could actually look at the dependence of the intensity, not just in wavelength, but also in position along this 50 nanosecond slit. And so you can make a sort of wavelength position diagram, and that looks like this. And you get a ring because if you have an expanding nebula, uh, if you have an expanding shell, uh, you find that that gives you uh, a ring. This is the expected behavior, which I'm sure is very familiar to anyone uh, who's ever done long slit spectroscopy. Um, so the hope then was that uh, by looking at the various lines that we had detected, we could probe how this molecule was excited. And actually, the answer turned out to be quite interesting. It, it seems to be a classic example of something that's called formation pumping, where the initial formation of the molecule leaves it in some excited state uh, that then decays. And you see the radiation, really, that follows immediately after its formation. So there's an error here. This should say C plus plus H2. So carbon ions that are plentiful uh, react with H2. The star on the H2 means actually that H2 is vibrationally excited. Uh, and if it is vibrationally excited, that reaction can go rapidly to form CH plus. And in general, it'll form CH plus in an excited vibrational state. And then we see the decay of that. And this was shown quantitatively uh, by my collaborator, Benjamin Godard, um, from Paris Observatory. But there was all, all, even before we tried to model this, there was a very curious puzzle, which is that the P branch is much stronger than the R branch. So what, what do I mean by this? The P branch basically consists of transitions where, as a molecule decays from its upper vibrational state to the ground state, the rotational quantum number increases by one. And the R branch is where it decreases by one. Those are the only two possibilities for dipole allowed transitions. And you can sort of see that here. The t lines on the top half of the plot are P branch lines. And the ones on the bottom part, which are way weaker, these are all on the same scale, are R branch uh, lines. So this was incredibly puzzling, at least to me, uh, because normally, particularly if you took look at two vibrational lines that originate in the same upper state, then uh, basically it's just molecular physics determines the ratio of those lines. It's nothing to do with uh, which molecules are in which state. We're looking at molecules in a particular state, and atomic, uh, molecular physics must tell us the ratio of uh, those lines. And ordinarily, the ratio of lines within a uh, vibrational band of a molecule are given by um, something called the hernal london factors. So in quantum mechanics, the thing that really matters is the dipole matrix element uh, coupling the uh, lower and the upper state. And typically, that has some value that is just the same for all transitions within a vibrational band. And then there are just these. Um, uh, simple factors, integer ratios that tell you the ratio of uh, lines originating in the same upper state. And so if you form the right ratio, you would expect then that uh, the ratio of the R branch, let's say, to the P branch, with some scaling that I won't go into, should be 1. They should be equally uh, uh, luminous once you've scaled it appropriately with it actually goes as uh, wavelength to the fourth, and this hernal london factor that I mentioned. So we would have expected everything to be on this dashed line at unity, but in reality, it's way less and is actually dropping with rotational quantum number. Uh, so if we look at higher line rotational states within the band, this uh, value is lower. 
So this was very, very puzzling to me um, until I read a paper uh, that I just came across by uh, Medvedev and uh, three other authors, including uh, Yoli Gordon, uh, who's here, as you know, uh, director of the High Tramp uh, project. And this paper showed that, uh, in fact, this behavior, this anomalous ratio, uh, would, was expected if the uh, dipole moment or the dipole matrix element for the transition is very small. Um, and the explanation of this is uh, normally you can sort of separate out two terms and take the product, but the vibronic part, the part referring just to vibration, can have a weak dependence on which rotational state uh, you're talking about because of centrifugal distortion of the molecule. And normally this is a tiny effect. There's just a little fractional change in the transition dipole moment with uh, rotational quantum number that you never notice. And so everything obeys the hernal london factors as expected. But that's OK unless the dipole matrix element is very close to zero. And then a small fractional cha uh, a small uh, change uh, can lead to a very large fractional change. In fact, the uh, dipole matrix element can flip sign. Um, and this was pointed out in this paper that I came across called Intensity Anomalies uh, in Diatomic Molecules. Um, and there are a couple of examples, or several examples, were given that basically showed that as the rotational quantum number changes, uh, you can get these little cusps where you plot uh, the spontaneous Einstein, radiative rate, the Einstein A coefficient, as a function of essentially the rotational quantum number of uh, the upper state. Uh, so you get this little cusp, and this is actually where the uh, transition dipole moment is passing through zero. Um, so I came across this paper, and so I figured, well, maybe we can figure out then the value of the rotational quantum number, we'll call it M0, at which uh, things flip sign. Uh, just based on the astrophysical data. Uh, so I did uh, a fit. If you work it out, this is sort of what you expect, um, this behavior. And so uh, this again shows uh, the data, uh, uh, the, the observed line ratios with the black points at the top with their error bars, and then what you would expect if the crossover point occurs at various different values uh, of uh, the rotational quantum number, or this M index, as they refer to it. So there's, you see values for 4, 6, 8, 10, 15, 20. If it was infinity, then uh, you would have the classical behavior, uh, where the ratio would be 1. And actually, if you look at this, the best fit is obtained around 8. So at j equals 8, the transition dipole moment should flip sign uh, according to the astronomical data. Um, and sort of in the interim, <laughs> uh, between uh, when I, or just before I found this paper and created this plot, um, I had been speaking to all the spectroscopists I knew, and I spoke to Mike McCarthy, and he passed this on to uh, Brian Shangala, who I'm sure many of you know, who's a postdoc here. Uh, and he suggested the solution of uh, this crossover point where the transition dipole moment uh, would switch sign, uh, and said he would calculate it. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, great, but uh, you know, this is probably going to take months, and uh, you know, I'll have to create a potential. And uh, uh, so I had made this plot in a couple of days. I was just about to send it to him when he emailed me to say he'd completed his calculation. <laughs> and uh, 
that he predicted that it uh, would be at a value of eight where the transition dipole moment would switch sign. So uh, this was just, uh, you can imagine, uh, a very exciting demonstration that, uh, hey, maybe we should believe in quantum mechanics. Um, I was sort of amazed, this is from the correspondence I pulled out of our email. I said, you know, how did you do this so quickly? Did you have a potential energy surface that's PS for CH plus? I imagine this would take forever. And uh, his response was, this is a homemade surface. It's amazing what can get done when you only have six electrons, one vibrational coordinate, and some enthusiasm. <laughs> and he had cut his teeth in his thesis on uh, uh, these beautiful studies of C60 in uh, Jung Ye's lab. So compared to C60, uh, this certainly is a very simple molecule with very few uh, vibrational modes. So a, a beautiful demonstration, I think, of how uh, these quantum mechanical calculations can go hand in hand with uh, astronomical observations. So this is really the end of what I wanted to uh, present to you. Um, uh, so the two takeaways beyond the very specific cases that I discussed is that there is a remarkable tendency to make molecules. This started uh, as early as a redshift of 7,000. Molecules uh, are even found in astrophysics containing the noble gas elements, which are obviously very unreactive. They used to be called the inert gases before people made xenon hexafluoride. Um, and helium hydride is one of them. There's also actually argonium, ARH+, we've discovered recently in the interstellar medium. And they can be found, uh, molecules can be found in very hostile environments. So this star is 10 to the 4 solar luminosities, it's 200,000 Kelvin, and still you have this molecule within uh, two hundredths of a parsec. And then with these two uh, Example cases, uh, I hope to have convinced you that uh, there's a very close interplay between fundamental studies and, of molecular physics and astrophysics. And I think this is really one of the key uh, legacies of Alex Dalgano's pioneering work in molecular astrophysics. So thank you very much, and I'll be glad to answer questions. <laughs>
difficult it is to, uh, well, actually impossible, to uh, determine the frequencies that you would need to know uh, to measure them spectroscopically. Um, probably one of the people at ITAM could, could, could explain why this is the case. I mean, what I learned in undergraduate is getting the eigenvalues is always easy. Eigenfunction may be tough. But yes. So one would think that the Well, uh, right. But if you want to know, um, you know, we really so need to know digits, them yeah. to one part in a million. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. sort of the standard. <laughs> um, and it's not any new physics. I think it's just the, the difficulty of solving the equations accurately enough. So basically, uh, none of these things uh, you would be able to identify convincingly without laboratory spectroscopy. They simply, even this very, obviously this is one of the simplest cases you could imagine, cannot be computed to the accuracy you'd really want. Okay, so my second question. Is dust important for the formation of this molecule, and how well do you know it? It's, it's you know, the, the cross-sections and all that. Right. So, uh, in, obviously, I mentioned two environments. Obviously, in the early universe, no dust. Oh, no, no, yeah. No, no. Uh, and in the planetary nebula, um, sorry, I was just on that slide. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Uh, in the planetary nebula, basically these gas phase processes are um, believed to be uh, dominant. Um, and I think it would be quite hard to get significant catalysis on dust uh, at the temperatures uh, where this is sort of all going on, where the gas is still several thousand degrees. I mean, it's a very uh, unusual environment for molecules to be present in such hot gas. Now, dust is probably critically important in cold, uh, dense clouds. And actually, uh, the main way that H2 forms is by dust. And that would be true in the outer parts of, this, uh, of the nebula. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I wonder why the H2 plus plus helium a reaction makes only a minor contribution to the abundance of uh, helium H plus. It right. It produces actually H2 plus in collisions with hydrogen. Yeah, so we, it did include that in the model. So the uh, H2 plus can form. Uh, and then I said that uh, helium has a lower proton affinity than hydrogen, so it's actually endothermic, but this is a very hot environment. So actually, uh, it's not negligible because of the temperature. I think it's really, it's just a two-step process. You have to make H2 plus first, and that's going to be down in abundance, uh, and then you would have to have a further reaction to make HEH plus. So it's sort of more efficient uh, as a, pro a formation process to go directly to HEH plus, but we did include it, and I think it might have been a minor contribution. And actually, John Black had mentioned that as the main contribution, which is why uh, his prediction was 300 times lower. Right. Uh, at one point, you mentioned that uh, the helium to H plus, helium and H plus uh, uh, radiative association is faster than. H plus plus helium. Why is that? Uh, I don't have uh, a good physical explanation of that, but that is, uh, and it's a big difference. So uh, I didn't really emphasize this, but at, uh, the early universe formation is dominated by neutral helium and H plus because helium recombines first because it has a higher ionization potential. That is something like three orders of magnitude slower than what we think is important here, which is the other one, helium plus plus H. And we get that here because the helium plus zone is bigger than the H plus zone, which is not people's initial intuition that it would be. Uh, so, but yeah, so there's a big difference. And I, you know, this comes out of calculations, and I. Maybe some people know, but I, I'm not one of them. Uh, I have a good physical explanation for that. Uh, speaking of hostile environments that you mentioned at the very end, 
Uh, do, you, do you expect that this thing can form in accretion disks around supermassive black holes? And if yes, is there any chance to detect it observationally? Mm -hmm. hmm. The temperature should be in the s roughly the same range if you take a really big black hole. Right. Uh, and you would have... Um, X-ray from the corona. Yeah, it would give you a lot of helium plus. So uh, the honest answer is I haven't thought about it. Uh, I don't know, um, yeah, I mean, uh, whether it would be detectable or not, I, uh, I don't know. It's an interesting question, though. Um, yep. I think we have time for one more question, and I think I saw yours first. Oh, OK, thank you. So. Uh, it's very tantalizing having this molecule at a few tens of redshift. Are there any transitions we might detect in any wavelength that could probe that time? Uh, you, you mean uh, HEH plus? Yes, HEH. Yeah, so um, I think the transitions you know, are going to be completely smeared out by redshift. I mean, there won't be sharp lines. Um, I think there had been some discussion of possible interaction with the cosmic microwave background that I don't quite recall. I think it was well below the uh, limit of detectability, but I think it might potentially give you a wavelength dependence to the power spectrum uh, that is maybe two or three orders of magnitude below what's expected. Uh, oh, sorry, what can be measured. Um, and I don't know what the backgrounds would be as well that you would have to worry about there. With that, I would like to thank uh, David again for this beautiful lecture, for really building on and expanding on uh, Alex's uh, legacy. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. And thanks so much for asking me.